GUI, a topic that is surprisingly complex, and that shows in the code as well. Even for a simple GUI, you need to do quite a fair bit of work. Thankfully, in this day and age, there are ways around it, and one of the more popular ways these days is to use web programming tools, namely HTML. Today, let's take a look at a Python tool that can help us with just that. More on this after the break. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. Today, let's put Python and eel together. Let's like a zoo. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, today we'll be talking about eel, which allows you to write web pages for use as a GUI for your Python program. So in today's video, we'll see how to set everything up, as well as how we can get the Python and JavaScript code to talk to each other. In order to follow along with today's tutorial, you will need to be familiar with Python itself, as well as web programming in general, in particular on the JavaScript part. So yes, you do kind of need to have knowledge of essentially four programming languages to, you know, do this properly. But if you already do, then setting up GUI for Python can be quite easy. Eel is certainly not the only Python programming library that allows you to use HTML to build GUI. That is, of course, a graphical user interface. You know, the thing with clicky buttons. However, it is one of the options that are quite easy to work with and is designed for you know, quick deployment in mind. Of course, in that particular case, you wouldn't expect it to be as fully featured as its competitors. But again, that's not what it's designed for. So today, we'll delve into what Eel actually is, and we'll write some code just to you know, take it through its paces. So yeah, lots of code today. Hopefully, that sounds fun. With that said, let's jump right in. First and foremost, how does this actually work? Luckily, that's not too difficult to explain. With Eel properly installed and running, essentially, you get a little browser window pop-up. Whatever web pages you create, which serve as your GUI, are being served up within the web page itself. And of course, you can interact with it in whatever way you want. Messages can be sent back and forth between your actual Python code and your front end. And that is kind of how everything hangs together. It's really as simple as that. In terms of setup, you really don't have to do very much. You would install eel using pip as per normal. Then within your Python program, you would simply import eel. Now, how you'd actually code everything is you would need a folder for all your GUI stuff. So generally, your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript pages will all belong in a web folder. There is nothing particularly special about the HTML or the JavaScript you need to write. The only thing to take note of is that you do need to include an additional script called eel.js. You don't actually need to create this file, eel sets that up for you. In your Python code, you would have to specifically initialize eel to use that particular folder. All you have to do is to say eel.start, that shows up your GUI, and yeah, that's it. You have GUI from a Python program. It's as simple as that. Of course, the fun part is to get Python and JavaScript to talk to each other, and Eel makes it really easy for you to do that. The idea is this, Eel essentially acts as the middleman. You tell it which functions you want to expose from one programming language to the other, and yeah, it basically adds that in place for you. So let's try this in both directions. Let's first start by having a button within our JavaScript GUI trigger a hello world message on Python. So let's break this down, starting from the Python code. As you can see, the import statements as well as the initialization statements do not change. But of course, we have added something extra here. This of course is your standard Python function. But now we've got this little decorator on top. What this is saying is that the hello function is going to be exposed by eel to JavaScript. And what that means is we can actually call the hello function from JavaScript. So let's take a look at how that works. Heading over here to our HTML page, which of course has embedded JavaScript, let's see what we got. On top of our hello world, we have now added a button to our HTML, and this button, when it is clicked, it runs the call Python function. That is defined here, but this function does something special. This function will call eel Dot hello. So these two names have to match. Notice that hello in JavaScript matches hello in Python because we can think of them as the same function. 
It's just that over here, we're trying to call a Python function through JavaScript. So that's the idea. Let's now go ahead and try and run this. Here's our GUI popping up. And as you can see, we are seeing our button exactly as we have written within our HTML. So clicking on the button causes this function to be called and hello world to be printed into the console. So that's what exposing is. You take a Python function and you make it callable within JavaScript. Of course, the converse is true as well. For this demonstration, let's start by looking at what exactly is supposed to happen. So all we have here is essentially our front end and the back end is sending in the time information as the program progresses. All right, so it's the back end sending information to the GUI now. So when it comes to the front end HTML, it's not too different from what you would expect. What I have here is a diff which acts as a container for whatever information is coming in. And I have a function here called add text. This text will simply find that diff and add in whatever information is supplied as the parameter to this function. So nothing too complex here. And again, similar to what we've done previously, we're going to expose this add text function. But the difference now is that we are exposing a JavaScript function to be called by Python. All right, so this is the setup on the front end. Hopefully nothing too complex here. All that's left to do now is to take a look at how the back end is triggering it. This is where I think you will find a slightly larger changes. First and foremost, there is something to take note about the yield.start function. If you were to call it normally, you know, without this stuff at the back, this is blocking. And what that means is that any code written after that statement will not run. Clearly, that's a problem in this context, which is why we add this additional parameter which says don't block on this function call. So once the GUI is open, Python actually continues on to run the rest of the code. And in this case, we have a while loop that runs forever. And here's the magic. Here is the function that keeps on calling add text via yield. So this is where our Python code is triggering off the JavaScript function. Of course, we want this to run forever, but at the same time, not block our GUI. So what we can do is we can say sleep. This essentially allows the code to pause and yield the time over for the server to do whatever it needs to do. Now, you will also notice one thing, and that is the ugly little red underline over here. Yes, if you're using any kind of linting feature in whatever IDE you are using, this will come up as an error because of course, eel does not have an add text function by default. Of course, your IDE doesn't realize that we're going to use expose and so-called add functions to eel, so it's going to show up as an error. So that is one unfortunate drawback of using eel. For me, I usually just switch the linter off altogether, but that may or may not be an option for you. So don't be too alarmed by all the errors that it's spitting out. Personally, to keep things simple, I prefer to have, well, the JavaScript being sort of the main logic that's leading into everything, whereas the Python backend just acts as a repository of functions that can be called via the front end. That also makes it easier because I don't need to have any running logic on the part of my Python code. Of course, functions don't do just that, right? Functions need to return values. And that's another place in which there is a little bit of a learning curve. You see, Whenever you call a function, it actually takes a while to run. This becomes a problem when it comes to JavaScript because JavaScript is famously single threaded. What that means is if JavaScript is tied up doing something, it's not going to have the time to render out the page. In other words, your GUI becomes unresponsive. I personally just work around that by having everything as a function. So instead of returning something, I would call the function on the other side. And that seems to work quite well. And what I mean is this. Let's try and run this program to see what kind of complexity there is involved here. Essentially, you have a front end. You can enter some numbers. You can ask it to sort those numbers and the result appears back on the GUI. So for the first time, there is some back and forth between the front end and the back end. The intuitive approach to doing this would be to essentially have two sets of functions on the front end. One to listen for when the button is actually being pressed and to go ahead and pick up the value out of the text box and send that over to Python. So that's what I'm doing here. Eel.sort is a function that's happening over here on Python. So this reads in the text and performs the sorting all in one line because 
yeah that's what i like to do with python um but the important thing is that we have an answer now that we need to send back of course the normal way would be to use a return but if you want to think of everything in terms of callbacks you can essentially what i've done is over here in javascript i have another function called show answers and this one is exposed to python once the answer has been determined by python python will call this function the answer is going to come through will pull the output diff and display the result there. So what Python is going to do is when it's done actually computing the answer, it's going to call this function to populate the answer on the GUI. If we were to reason through things in this manner, you realize that you basically never have to think about returns at all. It's just a bunch of functions calling each other and that seems to work quite well, at least for me. But I acknowledge it's probably not the best way to do things, especially if you have many functions. So let's look at a proper way of handling return values. Our program here is a little bit more complex, so let's look at it in two separate parts. The idea is this. The server is repeatedly trying to contact the front end, and that's how it's able to, you know, basically extract whatever that you are typing as you are typing it. But the front end is also able to poke the back end when I click on send and the message sends through. So let's look at these two separately. The simplest way to get Python to call a JavaScript function and to actually get its return value is to do it synchronously like so. Notice that I am calling read text box, which is a function that has been defined in JavaScript up here. Of course, it has been exposed accordingly. But notice that I'm calling it with two sets of brackets. You can ignore the second set of brackets right now, but notice that we can pull the return value and the return value is indeed appearing as you have seen in the console. So this is synchronous because what's happening here is that eel on the Python side will pause on this line and essentially waits for the result to come back. So this is probably the cleanest, the neatest way of getting return values. But of course, this only works for Python calling JavaScript code, simply because you can't do anything synchronous within JavaScript itself. Remember, JavaScript is single threaded. So you have to go async. And the way in which you do that is actually applicable in both directions, even though I'm only showing you the JavaScript method. Here's what's going to happen. Remember how we can click on the submit button to get uh, the front end GUI to trigger something on the Python code? Well, this is the function that's being called. And this function returns the text OK, which means we do need to pull the return value. This is the function called on the JavaScript code. Essentially, we're going to send the text box value over to Python. That's nothing new. But when there is an acknowledgement coming back, that is when we actually use the brackets at the back. What you put into the brackets is a function, and this function basically acts as a callback. So whatever return value gets sent over to that function, and you can process it however you like. So really, functionally, this is not very different from doing callbacks as we've described earlier, but this is sort of the official way. And as mentioned earlier, you'll be able to do this from the Python side as well. So you can always do callbacks within your Python code in the same way, right? Just have a second set of brackets, and simply put in the name of the function you want to call to handle the return value. So of course, if you do this on the Python side, then the function call will no longer be a blocking one. So these are the two official ways in which you are supposed to get return values back and forth across the two languages. And there you have it. Eel is a good way to just get a quick and dirty GUI together. Of course, it's important to remember that Eel was not designed to be, you know, the front end of a gigantic application. Or if you want to do some serious software engineering, you'll probably want to look at options that were specifically designed for that. But if all you're doing is just throwing together a quick GUI, then that's something you can consider. Another thing worth mentioning is that Eel seems to be quite new, and there are some bugs that you have to be careful about. For example, if you click too quickly, you may find that you actually run ahead of eel and then eel gets confused and then crashes, which uh, seems to be quite problematic. So it's definitely not perfect and it's definitely not designed for you to do very serious things. So do go into this with that in mind. Anyway, that's basically it. But let's not end off here. Let's take a look at this in a slightly bigger example because up to this point, we've just been looking at Hello Worlds. 
This here is a slightly larger example that uses eel as a front end. And uh, well, this is a mastermind solver. Now, I don't want you to focus too much on the actual algorithm here because there are some things I deliberately did not do correctly and there are other things that are not done very efficiently. But I thought I would use this as an example because it does a bit of heavy computation. Also, it works better visually, right? So there is actually some justification for using a GUI here. All right, so yeah, go into this with that expectation in mind. Now, this actual mastermind class is the one that is doing all the heavy lifting, but it works using, well, commands. So you could actually start up a Python console and then work with it that way. But we're here for the GUI, so let's take a look at what that actually does. The main code that gets the GUI going isn't too complex. All it does is act as a middleman between, well, the front end and calling functions from the mastermind class. Whereas the web front end is there to take in user input and generate appropriate output when we receive something from the Python code. All right. So I'm not going to go through the actual code. Much of this is just pure HTML stuff and pure Python stuff. That's the cool thing about using eel because it's just acting as a little glue in between these two things. So I'm going to go ahead and just start up my program here. And I have a mastermind app on my phone. What's happening now is it's telling me to guess this. So I'm going to go ahead and put in red, red, green, green. And what the app on my phone is saying now is that this one is black, this one is white, and the other two are wrong. In case you don't know how Mastermind works, you have to guess the correct sequence of colors. So now I can say next guess. And this is where Python does some serious work. There is a lot of processing going on, and I'm actually able to trigger this little please wait box. HTML is the one that's actually doing this, and it's waiting for the response to actually come back from the back end before this little box disappears. And there you go. Now that we've had the uh, process go through, the algorithm is telling me to make this as the next guess. So green, blue, green again, and purple. So when I guess that, the response now is black, black, white, white. And I can ask it for the next guess. Now, the way this algorithm works is that subsequent guesses get much faster because essentially the search space has shrunken considerably. So let me run this again. And the response now is black, white, white, white. So yeah, basically, assuming that I've actually coded this algorithm correctly, it should eventually find this within a couple of guesses. So green, purple, green, blue. Oh yeah, that's it, that's correct. So that's the answer, right, in four guesses. This isn't about the mastermind solving algorithm, it's more about showing this response. Instead of having to, you know, actually call the functions directly and use a command line and not have colorful output, we are now actually able to see everything, actually click and interact with, you know, the interface. And yeah, actually have this whole thing work in a way that just makes a lot of sense. So there you go. That is just one of many possible real world applications. And that's it. Hopefully this shows you that Eel is pretty powerful. It's definitely more than just a toy. I hope you'll find this useful. I hope you remember this tool when you want to have just quick and dirty Python GUI. But I think we've gone long enough, so let's go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.